Good morning. You guys must have uh, heard the 930 crowd and were envious and decided to step up. They were wild today, man, in a good way. Well, would you stand with me, hold your Bibles up, your iPhones, iPads. Welcome to all of you here and all of you watching online or joining us online. Say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what the Bible says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God, and I boldly confess my mind is alert, my heart is receptive, and I'll never be the same again. Never, never, never. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We've been doing a series entitled Dirty Christianity, and uh, it's really all about kind of following the pathway of Jesus, if not entirely following the pathway of Jesus. Everything about Jesus' life was so opposite of that that the Jews were looking for. They were looking for a, a king who came from a palace, from a line or a lineage of kings. And, and they were looking for something very, very different. And when Jesus came to earth, they found somebody very different, uh, one who was not afraid to go places that religious people would not go and to do things like touch lepers, talk to a Samaritan woman that Jewish people would not do. Now, this is not a slam on the Jewish people at all. I love Israel and the Jewish people. It's not that. I'm just saying it was very different because that's our frame of reference. When we read the Gospels, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and so on and so forth. And so we have to look at Jesus' life and realize that it was very different than what the religious people of that day were familiar with. And quite frankly, I think we're living in a day that uh, the church must become quite different than what religious people have seen it as for many decades, if not centuries. We must become different than what we've been in order to see results that we've never seen. Oh, don't get me wrong, we've seen outbreaks and revivals and we've seen things happen in our world. Uh, and many of those that have happened from Toronto to Kansas City to Florida uh, that, that have not sustained themselves. Those movements dissolved, disappeared. And, and though they were life-changing for many people and we're grateful for those movements, uh, if a movement doesn't create a lifestyle and doesn't make a change that forever changes us, is that movement better or worse? In other words, the Bible says it would be better to have never known the way than to know the way and depart from it. In other words, we really need to think in terms of not a moment, but a movement that is sustainable because we have a, an understanding of what Christianity really is and what faith really is. And quite frankly, I have found Christianity and faith to be really dirty, sometimes in a good way and sometimes in a bad way. And uh, the good way is that we're not afraid to be around people that are very different than maybe what the church is used to, because those are the people Jesus was around. And he, he wasn't apologetic about being around people that other religious people would have nothing to do with. And, and so as we approach Easter, the one time of year, here in about five weeks, six weeks, that people will come to church, I'm prepping us. Now, today is potentially a little dangerous, I will tell you that, um, only because uh, I, I had kind of an encounter yesterday morning that kind of messed with what I wanted to do today. And, and so I'm trying my best to, to follow what I feel like I'm supposed to do and what I'm supposed to say. And, and it's, it's pretty challenging today because inside me is this realization that, that Christianity to many people is an organization that is perceived as very mean and hateful. Um, we have strong convictions, and we should have. We have core values, and we should have. However, we were never called to worship those core values or those convictions. We're called to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so if you fall in love with what you believe instead of who you believe in, then it becomes filled with meanness and hate. 
because I am more passionate about what I believe than the person I believe in. We must be in love first and foremost, not with what we believe, but with the person in whom we believe. If I stay in love with Jesus and my core values guide me, then Jesus and the love of God is the foundation to my life, not my convictions. And, and as I say this, I realize I risk being greatly misunderstood. And, and I'm okay with that because what I'm about to say, I believe, will bear witness with people once it's been said and, and that you're going to go, I get it now. Because everything in life is about love. Everything is about love. The platform on which we built everything is love. As a matter of fact, so much so, the Bible says God is love. We say God loves the world, and he does, but God is love. He is the personification of love. So if I'm going to reach my world, everything about my life has to be built upon love. In other words, if I care about you, and I care about your life, and I care about people, that care, that compassion has to be totally enveloped with love. Even if you're mean and you're hateful toward Christianity, the challenge is we really believe that what we believe is going to change people's lives. And I agree with you. I believe that what I believe is life-changing for the whole world because it changed my life. However, if I fall in love with what I believe, I've missed the whole point. I must be in love with the one who helped me believe what I believe and to know what I know. I can't fall in love with the wrong things. I can't fall in love with a system. I can't fall in love with an institution. I have to stay in love with Jesus. And sometimes we gain so much knowledge. But the Bible says knowledge puffs up and love builds up. And so we get knowledge and that knowledge is important. But knowledge will never be more important than the love of God. What we know will never be more important than who we know. Get this in you. So I'm, I'm sitting in my prayer chair yesterday morning, and I'm having this time with God and just downloading this stuff to me. And I began to think about this, this series, Dirty Christianity, and, and, and just really wrestling with what this means, because I've never preached this series before. I've never heard anyone call Christianity dirty. And, and I know that's even going to be misunderstood if it's not put in the proper context. But Jesus washed the feet of disciples, that was dirty. Jesus spoke with a woman at the well who was a Samaritan whom the Jews hated and the Samaritans hated the Jews. That's dirty faith. In the Jews' eyes, they were always criticizing Jesus for doing things like that and being at parties they weren't invited to. And, and he just lived his life in places they had never, ever, ever been. Now, in the Greek language... The word love has several different meanings, and in the Greek language, they had different words that they used for different types of love. And this is where we get lost in our culture. We, in one minute, we're saying, I love my house. I love my car. I love this, and I love that. And then we turn around and say, I love my spouse. I love my... And all of a sudden, we're hold it, hold it. How can I... How can I best demonstrate I don't love my car? I have to wrestle with that. I like my car, but I don't love my car. Are you getting the point? In the Greek language, they made it very specific. There were three words used. One was agape, which was the love of God. And if you'll recall, when Peter and Jesus were having the conversation, Peter, do you love me? Jesus said, Peter, do you agape me? Peter said in his response, and we don't see this in any translation translated in English, Peter is saying, I phileo you. Because we always wonder why Jesus asked him three times, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, you know I love you. It's confusing in the English language. But Jesus was trying, do you love me, Peter? Do you agape me? You know I phileo you. Jesus could not get Peter to make that shift. Do you love me so much with the love of God that you would feed my sheep? Do you love my sheep the way I love my sheep? Because what I'm about to do, Peter, I need for you to emulate. I need you to represent me 
And I need you to understand what kind of love will be required to represent me. And so Peter didn't get it, at least initially. So we have agape, a God love that says, you know, I want to just love the way God loves. Secondly, we have a phileo type love in the Greek. And it means a friendship kind of love. Now, you're only going to be able to have so many friends. You're only going to be able to uh, phileo uh, so many people. You're only, they're, that's, you can't have thousands of friends. It just doesn't work. Now, you may know thousands of people, but you're not going to have that close friendship. So if you see someone that, that you really like and you hang out with, you would say, I phileo you. It means I love you as a friend. You're a friend to me. Jesus said, I no longer call you servant, I call you friend. So he identified, not only did he agape the disciples, he loved them as a friend. The third type is eros. An eros kind of love is an intimate kind of love, a sexual kind of love where you, you, you have a, an intention to engage with someone in, at that intimate level. And so you, you would never, in our country, you say, man, I love that person. Or I love. We don't understand. What are you really saying? How do you love me? Do you love me as God loves me? Do you love me as a friend? Or you just think I'm hot? <laughs> I told you this is a dangerous sermon today. Because when you start talking about love, you're talking about the core value of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. When you talk love, you're talking something about something that we have trivialized in our culture. That, that we really, we use it so flippantly. I love this food, I love this car, I love this house. And, and, and so when we start talking about love, something is lost. When we really don't stop and say, you know, do I really agape people? So I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking through this, and so we have the three names of love, and then as I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, God, how do we connect this to the world in which we live? And he said, well, there are three dimensions in which those loves operate. Number one is the eternal dimension. It's, it's the dimension that has no end. It's forever and ever and ever, and it's what God brought to earth in the person of Jesus Christ. That it was a love that was eternal. It was a love that would never end. It's a love that never leaves us nor forsakes us. It's a unique kind of love. And that's where all love is born is out of heaven. And when God sent his only son, he sent heaven to earth. And, and he said, I love you so much that I am going to give my life to you and for you. Now please grasp this. This is the kind of love that we call unconditional when we use the word grace and we use the words unconditional love, it scares a lot of religious people because religious people typically connect themselves to people like them or people that they like. And they like them based on them being alike. <laughs> We're alike. We, we see things the same way. We, we go to the same church. We're, you know, we're, we're Baptists. We're Methodists. We're whatever. And we begin to identify ourselves with something instead of someone. And so we have to recognize that when Jesus came and died on the cross, it was an unconditional love. And let me define this. He didn't come and say, now, he didn't go to the, to, to the mountain and, 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 or even when he was feeding the thousands. He didn't say, now, let me explain something I need for you all to do. He wasn't having town hall meetings making promises that they wanted to hear. He came to declare the love of God unconditionally. He didn't say, look, here's the deal. If I can get one million people to sign a document that they will worship me upon my death, I will die. He didn't get a petition signed, a promise made from people so that he could love them with the love of the Father. He simply came to earth and said, no matter what y'all do. Now, I don't think he said y'all because he wasn't from Oklahoma or Texas. <laughs> no matter what y'all do, I'm going to die for you. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking if I'm going to be crucified on a cross, I want some promises up in here. 
If I'm going to love you and I'm going to give my life or give to you, I want somebody to say there is going to be some reciprocity up in here. Because I ain't doing this without somebody coming back with something up in here. Now, this is a little confusing, so I'm going to try to navigate through this. You say, well, but, but how do you love somebody, and you love them, but you don't love them? Well, in the Greek, it's explained. I love you with the love of God, and this is why it, it gets a little sticky, but I, I don't love you the way I used to love you. We don't, we've moved on. So, like, for instance, I have friends that are still friends, but I don't hang out with them. So I phileo them, but from a distance, because... We're going in different directions. And sometimes when you split friendships, they see it as hate. They perceive it as mean. You don't like me anymore. No, I like you. Not only do I like you, I phileo you. I love you. However, you're going there and I'm going there. So it doesn't mean I cease to love you. It just means I cease to walk with you because I'm going a different direction. Even Jesus experienced this when he ran into the rich young ruler... And the rich young ruler starts asking him questions, and Jesus asks him questions. He says, I've done all these things since my youth. And Jesus said, sell what you have, give to the poor, and follow me. Well, he couldn't do that. The Bible says because he had much. So Jesus left. Jesus' love did not leave him. But Jesus said, I'm going this way, and you're going that way. So what we have to realize is that, that it was an unconditional love. It wasn't a love that endorsed everything that was going on or endorsed what people were doing. But it was the kind of love that said, you always need to know that I will always love you. Now, this, this foundation of love is critical, so it's eternal. The second category or dimension is internal. This eternal love must become internal in our lives. It must be something that we first grasp before we talk about it or attempt to demonstrate it. Because the Bible says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Turn in Matthew chapter 23. I'll read it in just a moment. That until you love you, and, and I know that in our world we would say, well, that's narcissism. That you love yourself. Oh, I, I love me so much. I look in the mirror and go, man, Mark Crow, I just love you. you know, and you'd say, well, that's just wrong. No, it's right. I can't love you if I don't love me. So on Sunday mornings, I have to get up and tell myself I love me. Why? So I can come and love you. And I just irritated some of y'all because you don't even love yourself. And you're irritated that I love me. And then you're going to be irritated that I love you because you don't love me. And you don't know what you're missing. Thank you, all one of you. But I want us to get this because our, our message to the world, the good news, has to be shared from this platform called love. Not hate, not meanness, but love. So I have to have an internal love before I will ever go to that next dimension of external love. Where now... Because of the eternal love that I have in relationship with God and understanding his unconditional love and knowing that he loves me, well, guess what? If I don't love me, I disagree with God because God loves me. So now I'm in disagreement out of faith with God because God loves me, but I don't love me. So I have to love me. It doesn't mean I love everything I do, but I love everything I am. Because everything I do does not fully accurately represent who I am. Neither does it you. You're created in the image and likeness of God. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. You're beautiful in the sight of God. You don't always look like it. you got smudges on your spiritual face. But that doesn't change God's love for us. This is so critical that we get this in us because we typically measure our love for others by their treatment of us. So if you mistreat me, or you do mistreat somebody I love, or mistreat somebody I know, it's very difficult for me to love you because I'm human. So I have to go back to the categories. I have to go back to an agape love and understand an eternal love that goes beyond where I'm at right now. You see, there are two ways that we love. We love vertical, and we love horizontal. Most of you today, in here and watching online, would say, I love God. 
and God loves me. That is a vertical love. But when it comes here, we have a difficult time because we measure people's response to us or treatment of us and, and miss the whole purpose of love. So if you don't treat me well, then I can't love you. Well, the Bible tells us we must love one another. If we say we love God, but we don't love each other, then the love of God is not in us. So as we approach Easter, the question becomes to me, who do I love and how do I love them? Now look at this. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 34, the heading is the greatest commandment. The greatest, not a great commandment, but the greatest commandment, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Now listen to this. Love your neighbor as yourself, verse 40, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. All the commandments, or all the law and all the prophets hang on. On these two commandments. So everything God ever said. Every law that was ever established. Every prophetic utterance that was ever given. Hang on these two commandments. And that has not changed today. So let me give us a case in point here. And I'm going to get really dirty today. I mean I said things in 930. I've never said in 40 years I preached. You may want to watch it online and be shocked. I'm going to watch it and be shocked. But I am exhausted with church politics. I'm exhausted with religion. I'm exhausted with how we treat one another in the body of Christ. I'm exhausted with it. We preach one thing and we do something else. The reality is we have got to begin to live what we love. Now... In Florida, we had a horrific event last week. Horrific. And I follow these. I'm a news junkie, and I read articles, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to challenge myself because when these things happen, I try to put myself in the skin, in the flesh of those who lost people they loved, innocent people that did not deserve to die. And, and there are all these different news media outlets are always looking for conflict. How many of you know conflict is how they make their money? And the ones who tell us we shouldn't hate write articles that create hate. And they do it because it sells their their paper, their news, online media, whatever. And if you're in the media, it doesn't mean you're that person, but let me just tell you this is how it works. So you read all these different articles slanted in the way they want you to believe. Okay, so obviously we have a shooter who goes into a school and begins to kill innocent children and teachers. And the very first thing that surfaces in us is how we want to see him suffer for the decision he made to murder innocent people. That's natural. That's, that's the nature of mankind. However, it is not the nature of God. God's love for that foolishness and that act that was perpetrated by that man, that young man, did not change God's love for him. Now, I don't want to sound insensitive at all, but here's my point. Then you have anti-gun activists saying it was the gun. Let me tell you something. You go back to, to Cain and Abel, murder has been a part of society from the beginning of time because it's fallen and that's not going to change. 
So we think we're always looking for a solution outside the real solution. Okay, so if this kid doesn't have guns, guess what? On any given morning, you're going to have hundreds of kids walking across parking lots. You want to kill them, all you got to do is get a dump truck. Okay, let's, let's quit being stupid and ridiculous and, and blaming it on a, a, a piece of equipment. Murder is in the hearts of man, not in the hands of man. Now, let me go out on yet another limb here. When you ask God to exit an institution, He will. When we said Jesus can no longer be in school classrooms, His word is removed from that institution, you have removed the power of God, and we're sending our kids into godless zones. And I know you say we have Christian teachers, but they're wearing muzzles and handcuffs. And here's what we say. I don't have kids in school anymore. It doesn't affect me. No, listen. This is what we say. We, we go silent on things that we don't want to get involved in. We don't want to be, participate in. We don't want to be included in. Look, you know what? I don't want to get involved. Because if I get involved, then I'm involved. That means whatever happens, I'm now a part of that issue. Now, please don't miss this. It's exactly... What the devil has been planning for thousands of years is to silence the voices of people who are believers in Jesus Christ and refuse to bow our knee. We'd rather die than switch. Now, we don't talk about this anymore because if I tell you to, that the Bible says the last commission, the greatest commission, the great commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel. When I say those words and you read Matthew 28, something happens that says, I now become responsible because I know what I'm supposed to do. And the Bible says to him who knows the right thing to do and to him who does not do it, it's sin. So now all of a sudden I start talking about how we're supposed to win people and we don't come to church to go to heaven. Can I just help you with that? I'm not here so I can go to heaven. I'm here so I can bring heaven to earth. That's why I'm here. Every time we gather in his name, we're bringing and, and inviting heaven to come to earth. Every time you pray in your chair at home, you're saying, Jesus, come to earth. Come to my chair. Come to my life. Come into my room. Come into my family. That's what we're doing. We're calling on heaven. And the more we rally, the more people see groups and bodies of people, the more they want to be a part. But they want to be a part of something that is authentic and real and not judgmental. We're not the judge and jury. We're called to be the lovers of all mankind. And you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not easy. When you have to look in the eyes of families who've lost somebody they've loved and try to encourage them that the healthiest thing that could possibly happen for any of us, and trust me, none of us want to be in this position. But dirty Christianity, when the way I see it, Jesus, the Son of God, was murdered 2,000 years ago. And he demonstrated to us how to look in the eyes of of murderers as he's breathing his last and he died publicly I think there was a total design of heaven for him to do this so that the world could hear these words father forgive them for they don't know what they're doing this is the son of God never sinned never made a mistake and yet he's being crucified we can't stand to be criticized and yet the son of God is being crucified I'll be criticized for my faith. I'll be criticized if I talk about Jesus. I'll be criticized if I invite people to church. I'll be criticized. We have become sissified in our culture because we don't want to be criticized and we don't want to be identified while other lifestyles are being promoted and shouted. We have been silenced for fear of being criticized. I didn't say be mean. I didn't say retaliate. I didn't say it's us against them. It's us for them. 
It's us for the world. We're not against the world. We're not against what somebody else is doing. We are for people. Jesus did not die for situations and subjects. He died for mankind. Every time there's an opportunity to speak, everything we say should be seasoned somehow with love. Because everything you and I say can and will be used against us in other conversations. It's difficult because you will be misunderstood, as will I. This message will be misunderstood. But this is the core of who I am. I don't worship the core of who I am. I worship the God who changed my life. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I was addicted, but now I'm free. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. The world is dying to hear what God did to you and for you, not what you think about them and what they've done. This is not about what people have done. This is about what Jesus did. This is not about you need to stop this. It's, you know what, I just want you to receive the love of God. I want you to have a hope like never before. I want you to dream big dreams. You're not addressing their foolishness. You're not addressing their sin. You're addressing that they are created in the image and likeness of God. And the love of God is so absolutely real. And I just want you to know that love. What do I have to give up? Don't worry about what you have to give up. But you just need to start thinking about how you're going to live your life more abundantly and how you're going to get up every day happy and and fulfilled and overcoming this life and the problems of this life that's what we have to do there's nothing more attractive than someone who loves Jesus and agapes the world and they have a smile on their face you know, I, I, when, when I, I, I'm not a social media fan at all um, because a lot of it is being a pastor and knowing the things I know. A lot of it is just people trying their best to look the way they want to feel. Does that make sense? Look the way they want to feel. And I, I hear that and I feel that. But here's the problem. is that we all look and see or attempt to see the authenticity of that. But can you feel that? Do those around you, do those around me feel that? It's a challenge to love those that don't love you challenge to say the least but we're called to we're called to love everybody I fight it every day stupid is so prevalent on our planet and every now and then I find myself in that group called stupid and then I realize I too am stupid from time to time so if I, too, am stupid, even once in a month, I still fall in. Yeah, thank you. I do appreciate that. Um, they're laughing, thinking only once a month. Come on, Pastor, really? We know you get your stupid on every day. Okay, okay, I got it. Okay, I got it. But falling into that category, if I only fell into it once in a lifetime, I still fall into that category. I still need the love of God. I still need the grace of God. I still need the mercy of God. And as long as I know I need the mercy of God, it means I need to be a carrier of that mercy. I need to be a carrier of that love. I need to be a carrier of that grace. You know, there's a story told, and you've probably heard me say it many times. I, I just think about it every year around Easter. There was a, a precious woman who served God her whole life. She married a man who didn't know God. He was a good man, but he didn't know God. And every Sunday she would get up and go to church for as long as they were married. 
Every Sunday she'd be in church, faithful attender. And all she asked of her husband was, would you go to church with me once a year? Just one time on Easter. That's all I'm asking. And for their entire marriage, year after year, he would go to church with her. It was their routine. And he would go in, and she knew that they had to sit on the back row because he wasn't going to go front. And so they sit on the back row, and at the end of the message, every year he would get up, walk down that row, exit, go to the, 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 out the, the door, and leave. He did what he said he would do. But one year, the pastor who had been there for as long as she had been there retired. And the board voted in a new pastor, and Easter rolls around. It's his first Easter pastor's first Easter in the church and the husband honored his commitment to his spouse and went to church with her on that Sunday just like he always had throughout their long marriage history at the church on this particular Sunday the pastor preached and pretty much same music same type of sermon but but there was something a little different and on that particular Sunday as usual after the sermon husband gets up And this time, instead of walking out of the church, he walked toward the front of the church and met the pastor down front. The wife was stunned, shocked, didn't know what to say. So on the way home, she finally got up the courage to say, you know, what what happened? What was different? She said, well, he said, well, every year that I'd go with you, he would talk about people going to heaven and hell. And he actually talked like he was a little excited about those going to hell. He said, but this year, this pastor talked like if anybody was going to hell, it broke his heart. And I felt his love. That's why I went forward. It's not about your message. It's about the love with which that message is delivered. It's about your compassion for people who are hurting and dying and and suffering and are lost and going to hell. Who are lonely, who are hopeless. We all know those people. We see them. And yet we criticize them just like everybody criticizes other people. When you see them on a street corner begging for money, don't be critical of those people. Love those people. I didn't say you had to give anything to them at all. But maybe an encouraging word, praying for you. Now, they may get mad at you because they're saying, I don't need your prayers, I need your money. I get that. But the reality is we need to look at everyone with love and compassion because that's how Jesus looked at us and that's how he looks at us today. But with that said, we have been silenced for fear of criticism, for fear of how people would perceive a Christian. And the reason the world doesn't like Christianity or Christians, and if you've ever watched Christian response to certain things, sometimes I don't even want to be identified as a Christian. Because I've watched Christians on talk shows just be mean. If we would... You know, you say, but, but, but they're being truthful and honest. You can be truthful and honest without being mean. You say, it just it breaks my heart that, you know, I love everybody. I love you. And I, you know, I, I, I was on a, a program in New York City one time promoting a book. And uh, there was a, a priest and a rabbi hosting that program. And uh, right before I went on the program, it was a nationally, Larry King used these guys all the time when he was on television. When any religious topic came up, came up Larry King would refer to this priest and, and rabbi who had a show in, uh, in, in New York, a very popular show. So uh, the publisher got me on this show in New York City. So I go up there, and, and he's explaining to me. He's a guy I went to college with, and he's explaining to me the dynamics of this program. And I'm thinking, how do I address a priest and a rabbi? I mean, this sounds like a bar joke. <laughs> a priest, a rabbi, and a pastor went into a bar. <laughs> you know, but, and that's what it was. A priest, a rabbi, and a pastor go on TV. And so I, I'm promoting my book, and, and I'm thinking, how do I make an impact on this audience w- without, you know, being divisive? So I'm telling my story, and the rabbi asked me, well, how does that affect me? I said, I'm not sure it affects you at all. I said, I'm just telling you my story, and you have your story, I have my story. And I said, my story is I know that I wouldn't be who I am, and I wouldn't be where I am had Jesus not intervened in my life. I didn't argue with him. I didn't say you're wrong and I can't believe you and you need to convert. I I just told my story. See, all the world's looking for is for us to tell our story and tell it with love. Not tell it with I'm right and you're wrong. I didn't tell him he was wrong. 
I said, this is what worked for me. You know, and when you tell somebody, this is what worked for me, they will ponder how that worked for you. They'll start thinking about how it could work for them. You don't have to drive the point home. You don't have to stuff it down their throat. All you got to do is show up for work every day. And, and, and you know, if, if I was working in, in a secular job, I think the greatest testimony of all is that when you show up on Monday and everybody's got a hangover, uh, you know, and, and you walk in with a skip in your step, you know, and, and you don't judge them. They go, man, this sucked, the daily grind, working with a man. And you look and say, is there anything I can do for you today? <laughs> They're going to look at you like your Tinkerbell. Is there anything I can do for you? It's just a great day. I am so glad for Monday. Because, you know, there are people that aren't having a Monday because they died on Saturday. I'm having a Monday. And they'll say, what is a Monday? It's another day that I get to live. It's another day in my life. Getting happy. Not judging them. Matter of fact, if you have that, just start taking a bottle of Tylenol or Advil to work. Saying, I, I, here, let me help you. Instead of, I hope you suffer. I've heard Christians say, I just can't wait for them to hit bottom. I hope you're there when they splat. It gets all over you too. You don't want people to hit bottom. You want to catch people. You want to be a safety net. You want to do everything you can to help them not hit bottom. But that's the only way they're going to learn. No, there's a thing called knowledge that every now and then, the right information delivered with the right heart can intervene in a person's life in such a way that they don't have to hit bottom. Look, folks, we got people crossing oceans. They're missionaries, and they'll cross oceans to go win a nation, but they won't cross the street to win their neighbor. I always hate it when I hear people being missionary. How many people have you led to Jesus in America? None. I'm called. Then don't go overseas. Do everybody a favor and stay home until you can learn to cross your street. Don't get on an airplane and cross an ocean. Because I know it's sexy to say I've, I've lived in Africa, and I have. Sexy to say I've, I've spent a lot of time in London teaching, and I have. That sounds really like, ooh. But what really sounds ooh to me is my neighbor had a flat the other day and didn't have a jack, and it was cold, and it was raining, and I just went over and jacked it up for him, helped him change the tire. I didn't say one thing about Jesus. Yeah, you did. You said more about Jesus than you'll ever know by being there and helping someone and demonstrating love. He's either John Wesley, Charles Wesley, one of the Wesley brothers, you know, go into all the world and preach the gospel and use words when you have to. But not until you have to. Because the world is sick and tired of religious words. They're looking for spiritual people who love God and will allow that love to permeate their lives in such a way that it overflows into theirs. I want to ask you to do something. You can get mad at me. I don't care. There have been a lot of people mad at me. Easter is about five weeks away. It's one time a year. People will go to church, most, most church attendance any other time of year. A lot of people won't be invited because people in church are, think that they, everybody's been invited. We live in America. Everybody's inv been invited to church. You know there are tons of people who've never been invited to church. All they're looking for is someone to ask them. You say, well, I, I'm not really into that. My faith, I always love this one. You know, my faith is private. I'm sure glad Jesus' faith wasn't private. <laughs> I mean, I think if our faith should have been private, he should have died in the synagogue with the doors closed. But instead, he chose to die in public place, out in front of everybody, because he wanted to show everybody how much he loved them. 
And if Christians don't get outside the temple in the church building, we're not really dirty Christians. If we just come in here and we never go out there, we're not really telling his story well. Now, I know that this, this goes against the grain of what a lot of you believe, but you know what? Damn it, it's just time to get it done. Now, some of you are more concerned that I said, damn it, than somebody who's going in your neighborhood going to hell. <laughs> and that may be the last time you hear it in church, because you may never come back. But I just felt the need today to kind of drive this point home. Get mad at me if you want, but I'm just not very religious anymore. I'm tired of people dying to go into hell on my watch. And I'm tired of us being so stinking caught up in what we say and not caught up in what we do that it's time to shake it up and break it up and say we're going to be different. Now you can go home and call all your friends and not go back to that church. Okay. I just... I just think sometimes we live in a bubble. You hear, and you said that yourself. Only you said it in private, and Jesus heard it just like he heard it here. <laughs> we live in a different world in a different day. And we are so out of touch with a lost and dying world that we care more about our performance than their eternity. I don't care anymore about it. I don't because you know what the people that I want to reach and that this church has to reach are the people who say what I said on an hourly basis and besides that that's not going to send them to hell anyway it's sure been fun We have five weeks. Within the five-week period of time that I'm talking about, many will die. Many in our city, many in our neighborhoods, many of the people that we work with will go into eternity. The question we have to ask is, did they know I was a Christian? If I was put on trial for my faith, would there be enough evidence to convict me of that faith? You see... I don't have a lot of time left. I'm getting older. No, think about it. The average age people live to 78 years old in America. I was looking at that the other day going, I don't even need a calculator (laughs) to tell me how much longer that is. What will I do with the rest of my life? Will I care about what you think? Will I care about what you think when I, when I say something like, well, do I care about that? No, not anymore. I don't care anymore. What I care about is I'm getting closer and closer to hearing these words. Enter in, my good and faithful servant, or depart from me, I never knew you. When I think about those two possibilities, something inside me says, I really am pretty sure I want to hear, enter in. And I want to bring a boatload of people with me. So I want to ask you to start now and hand out cards and just tell them, look, I don't even want you to come until Easter. Make them kind of go, what? I used to tell my teenagers that. I say, look, when I was, I'd, I'd tell them every year, I'd start this thing called the Bible. I say, oh, I want you to put a Bible on your nightstand. Don't open it. If I've, God will tell me if you opened it. Don't open that Bible. Next week, I'm going to let you open it and close it. Third week, I'm going to let you fan the pages. Just simple, you know, these are pray. Just don't read it. If you read it, God will tell me. Fourth week, I'm going to open it, and I'm going to let you read the top, 1 Chronicles 9, 24. Don't read any, any of it. Don't, don't, don't think about reading it. Get the picture? People only want 
what we have if we love what we have. Why would I want to be a Christian if I acted like the devil or you acted like the devil? I said, get born again, you're going to burn in hell. <laughs> People standing on corners, turn or burn. I want to go pay them to burn. <laughs> could, could you go burn somewhere else, please? You're messing up my street corner and making my gospel a lot more difficult. <laughs> turn or burn doesn't work. Love like a dove does. <laughs> the Holy Spirit, you know. Okay. I'm done. Uh, let's pray. <laughs> we really need to. A lot to talk about this week. Father, we do love you so much, and we're so grateful for all that you do for us and all that you've done for us. Um, God, today, in all seriousness, I do pray that everyone understands my motivation and my heart behind everything I said today. Sometimes we just have to be shocked into the harsh reality that there is a forever and that we will all spend forever somewhere in forever. So, Lord, I pray right now that those watching online and those in this building would feel the love that I have for them, but more importantly, the love that you have for them. None of us are good enough to go to heaven. None of us can do good enough to go to heaven. Once we realize that, we realize there's only one way. And Jesus said, I am that way. And we realize that it's not about how good we are. It's about accepting how awesome you are. And the work that you did on the cross. Every head bowed and every eye closed. You say, Mark, I've not called on the name of the Lord. And I've, I'm not a Christian. But I want to be. I'm, I realize now it's not about how good I am or how bad I am. It's, it's about exercising faith and believing in the one who gave his life for all mankind. So if you, that's you, and you say, I've never called on the name of the Lord, would you just lift your hand up and put it right back down? I want to pray for you. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you, sir. Thank you. Are there others? I want to do that today. I'm not going to require anything of you because I know that I see your hands, and I'm in agreement with you. Nothing wrong if we did it differently, but today, are there others? You say, that's me. Okay. Those of you watching online, I pray that... Right now, you just lift your hand up in your apartment, your house, wherever you are. Put it right back down. Just acknowledge, I need Jesus. Pray this with me. Say, Father God, thank you for loving me so much that you sent your only son. Jesus, thank you for giving your life for me. Today, I give my life to you. I repent of my sin, and I make you the Lord of my life. Amen. There's a card in the seat back in front of you. It says, I accepted Jesus as my Savior today. If you didn't lift your hand but you prayed that prayer, please grab one of these and just check that box. Put your name in there so we'll know who you are. Uh, we want to be able to pray for you this week and, and just know and that, that we're praying for you. If you put your number on there, we just want to we want to be able to just to contact you and say thank you. Is there anything we can do for you? Uh, at this time, we want to receive our tithes and our offerings. I was reading a, a devotional yesterday morning, and I'll be very quick with this, but it, and I've said this before, we oftentimes think if people suffer enough and experience enough pain that they will change. Pain and suffering are not what create change, because if you're suffering and you have pain, you may not know what to do. What creates change in our life, our lives, is knowledge. Once you get knowledge of something and know what to do, and you do it, and change begins to happen, You've heard the definition of insanity is doing the same thing, expecting different results. Do you know how many people today, tomorrow, and the rest of their lives will do the same thing and hope for different results? Typically doesn't happen. What happens is when we make a change, in, for instance, as you give your life to Jesus, the Bible says you're a new creature. The old things are gone, the new things come. Why? You did something different. You gain knowledge. You mean if I call on the name of the Lord, I'll be saved. When you do that, you're saved. That knowledge is what brought me out of a very painful life in my past. 
where I didn't know God. And when I heard that I could know him, not, not that I, I had to perform well to know him, not that if I was really good, he would accept me. But when I heard those words, if you'll call on his name, you'll be saved. And I did them. Everything changed for me. I was in great pain. I was suffering. I wanted to die. I was suicidal. All of those things. But when I got that knowledge and I did something with it, everything changed. You know, it's really strange when I teach on giving, and, and I had a lady in the lobby after 9.30 say, so, you know, I used to think this and that about giving, and I didn't, and now I'm trying to get back, you know, to this place of God, forgive me for, you know, I was thinking the money did this and that. I want you to understand something. This is not about even what Mosaic does, though we give a lot of money, and we have from day one, to missionaries, to help kids, and we, we you know, we're at Will Rogers' apartments every week. I mean, we're doing stuff with it, but let's just say this. This is not about us. This is about you. This is about your obedience to obey the word of God. That's what it's about. So when you have knowledge, if you give, it shall be given. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. That's what the Bible says. When you get that knowledge and you apply it, then something begins to happen that you have simply hoped would happen, but you didn't do anything with the truth or the word that says this is how you get from poverty to prosperity. And, and when I use that word, some people get angry, but the reality is it's God who's given us the power to gain wealth according to De Deuteronomy 8.18. So if God just gave everybody money, and then we'd be questioning, why does the mafia have all the money and the missionaries are suffering? God says, I've given you the power to gain wealth. And the power to gain wealth begins with our obedience to sow. You will reap what you sow. So God says, I've given you principles by which to live and by which to give. And if you'll do those things, here's what will happen. So today, if you're suffering and you're struggling, then put into practice. If you're struggling with you know, somebody, you need to forgive them, forgive them. The Bible says, forgive and you'll be forgiven. It's all about having knowledge. That's why we read the Bible, to gain knowledge so that we can experience all that God has. So if you're writing a check today, simply write it to Mosaic. There's an offering envelope in the seat back in front of you and a pen. You sat on it. You may not realize it, but you're sitting on a pen right now. Some of you. And you, oh, I wondered what that was. I thought these were just cheap chairs. No, we put pins there. Well, not like stick pins, you know, like riding pins. Okay, so anyway, um, you can you use those. If you want to give by text, 405-546-2226. Very simple way to give. And I would encourage you to set that up and make it a part of your regular giving practice. All right, ushers, go ahead and pass the buckets as they're doing that. Let me remind you, stop at the information kiosk, pick up the invite cards. Give those out every week, and let's get ready for Easter. Last year, we had 1,200 people our first year at Easter. I mean, this year, I'm believing for 2,000 people. You say, well... Where are all those people? Well, some of y'all are here that came for the first time. Others are out wandering around still. <laughs> we went Easter. <laughs> Okie dokie then. Anyway, so anyway, get ready for Easter. Also, if this is your first time at Mosaic Church, stop by the information kiosk. We have a gift for you. And just tell the people working there, we're a first-time guest. Pastor told us that you had a new car for us. <laughs> now some of you will stop thinking that was true. And you're really going to be mad at me today. All right. So uh, please stop by there. Remember this, these words every week. Make time for God every day. Make time for God's house every week. It'll change your life. Let's stand. And then we're going to go out with a shout of hallelujah on three. One, two, three. Hallelujah. <laughs> i
Motivated, oh, I am taken by.